section one of melor of the silver hand and other stories of the bright ages this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. melor of the silver hand and other stories of the bright ages by david byrne melor of the silver hand very long ago there lived in a cornish monastery a boy named melor he was an orphan and his father had been a cornish prince reigning happily enough until his own brother reynald revolted against him and put him to death and indeed if the bishops and clergy of those parts had not used all their influence with reynald and implored him to spare the life of his nephew melor himself would have shared the fate of his father but although the wicked usurper permitted the son of his murdered brother to live before sending him into one of the cornish monasteries to be brought up reynald hacked off the poor child's right hand and likewise his left foot partly no doubt from the motive of revenge partly in order to make the boy incapable of bearing arms in future years now in the remote days of the fifth century artificial limbs were not very skilfully constructed and yet the good monks in whose care melor was placed full of pity at the sight of a young and comely boy so sadly mutilated by his own uncle set to work to contrive for him a new hand and a new foot and as he was the son of a prince they decided that the hand ought to be made of pure silver while the foot should be wrought in brass so in spite of the loss of two such valuable limbs the boy melor grew up happily and contented joining in all the games of the schoolfellows and showing himself more diligent than some of them in the abbey school and always attentive and devout within the stalls of the minister choir even the wildest of those rough cornish lads loved and respected him too much ever to laugh at his lameness or to jeer at the noise poor melor could not help making on the hard stone floors with his heavy brazen foot it may be too that they respected the swing of that silver hand for melor was strong and brave as his father had been and had no reason to fear aught that might befall him saving treachery so magnanimous was the boy that on the rare occasions when a fight was forced upon him he would use only his hand of flesh seldom however did boys of his own age challenge him to such unequal combat but indeed there was small reason for any but the most ill-conditioned to quarrel with a princely lad who made so light of his misfortunes and the cruel treatment of the uncle whose prisoner he actually was just precisely when a strange story began to circulate among the abbey scholars no one could rightly say but like most rumours it grew greatly by repetition losing nothing by being whispered into one ear after another and discussed in quiet corners of the cloister or in the intervals of games some boys spoke of it in a scared awestruck way that frightened their listeners one or two of the most ignorant and therefore the most superstitious began to avoid the boy of the silver hand a few who were devoured by curiosity watched him in an eager fascinated way which but for his absence of self-consciousness he would have found embarrassing not one of his companions had the courage to ask him if what they had heard was actually true the rumour was that the young prince was beginning to use his silver hand as though it were a living limb one boy had seen him catch a ball with it another had beheld him to use it to pluck a wild rose from the briars another had caught him in the act of clasping his beer cup in the refectory another was ready to declare on oath that in a recent game when he took hold of the metal hand it returned his pressure and gently closed upon his own fleshy fist however honest and good a boy may be he can never be liked by all every man every boy is sure to have his enemies and detractors 
one lad who had once forced a fight upon melor only to be ignominiously beaten by the one hand of flesh roundly declared that sorcery was at the bottom of this strange mystery of the moving of metal fingers and that such a lad ought not to be harbored in a cloister school retailing his suspicions to a friend a lad who also had a grudge against melor the pair denounced the young prince to their master a holy monk named jerome father jerome rebuked them severely my sons he said you are acting as the acolytes of satan your suspicions are as silly as they are wicked as foolish as they are unfounded melor's life is too pure and good much too well known for its virtue and sincere piety ever to be subjected to such a calumny as this to a boy who is as dear to the good god as melor undoubtedly is everything is possible and though i do not say that any miracle is taking place amongst us myself i have seen nothing of what you hint at i should not be in the least surprised if our lord put life and virtue into that poor lad's silver limb what however i suspect is that as he grows older his thirteenth birthday is just past he becomes more and more dexterous in the use of his artificial hand if men are often deceived as to the nature of the things they think they see and if the expert use of any limb may at times deceive the quickest eye it is small wonder if young and inexperienced boys like you should deceive yourselves however let me hear no more of such wicked suspicions or i promise you your penance will be worth the doing above all things i forbid you to make any mention of this to serialton now serialton was in a certain sense melor's jailer a creature of reynolds court serialton was responsible for the safe custody of the usurper's nephew whenever the boys left the abbey precincts as they frequently did this tool of the murderer was bound to accompany and to keep a sharp eye upon his charge outwardly he was kind enough to the child and indeed but for the fear he had of his master prince reynold he would gladly have shown loyalty and affection to the son of the murdered prince melor himself had no sort of fear of his keeper indeed the lad knew not what fear was so whenever they went abroad he chatted as gaily to serialton as to any of the monks or as to any of his companions sharing with the man the spoils of the expeditions fruits or flowers nuts or berries according to the season of the year much forest land lay within a little distance of the monastery and the boys delighted to explore the dense and pathless woods in spring and summer sometimes losing themselves in the dark cool formless aisles where only birds and beasts trees and flowers were ever found and yet to many of them the autumn time was especially sweet on account of the great store of nuts upon which they could not only feed at will but fill their bags and satchels with a harvest that would serve them well during the long cold months of winter it happened on a lovely october day the first of the month as the boys swarmed hither and thither in the woodland laughing and shouting from pure joyousness and stripping the hazel boughs of their already ripened treasure that serialton keeping a keener eye than usually on melor seemed extraordinarily moody and silent indeed some who noticed the face of the miserable man on that afternoon saw in his countenance an expression of fear and anxiety that they had never beheld before melor himself was conscious of nothing but the stir and bustle of the outing the beauty of the day the hilarity of his companions and the rich harvest of nuts that he and the rest were reaping climbing tree and bush as nimbly as any squirrel the lad showed himself equal to the quickest of his schoolmates in seizing and stripping the heavily laden boughs apparently solicitous for his safety serialton stood ever at the foot of the tree until his young charge had descended more than once the man turned pale with fear his legs shook beneath him and he was compelled to steady himself by leaning against the trunk of the tree 
he had seen or thought he had seen the boy clasp the bough and pick the nuts with his silver hand as neatly and easily as though the limb were of living flesh and blood long ago he had heard the strange rumour and only yesterday he had carried it to his master the prince the usurper had shown both rage and terror it needs but this he had said to serialton to take away the very last support to my rule already you have reported to me that the boy is brave and clever virtuous and pious loved by the monks and by his companions it needs but the rumour of his possession of a miraculous hand to make him worshipped by the people as a saint cowardly cur that you are do you not see what your duty is in such circumstances as these or must i myself come to the monastery and hack the pair of you in pieces with my own two-edged sword the creedless are always the credulous and the most guilty are always the most superstitious serialton was consumed with fear his whole soul revolted against the idea of murdering in cold blood a pure and innocent child and yet that if he did not do so his own life would be forfeit he knew but too well if only he could deny this strange and uncanny rumour if only he could report to his master that there was no sort of truth in the report that the silver hand was supple and prehensile yet alas for him his own eyes now witnessed the wonder so overwrought was he by superstitious fear that as he gazed at the boy sitting astride a bough it seemed to him that the silver fingers were far more dexterous than those belonging to the hand of flesh and blood there are too many of us here melor said serialton as the boy jumped from the bough with a great thud of his brass foot on the earth let us go a little deeper into the forest down here the nut trees are particularly well laden yes bring your sack and satchel we may need them chatting brightly to his keeper the boy plunged with him further and further into the dark interior of the woodland but serialton said the boy it looks so very gloomy yonder i doubt if i shall be able to see the nuts twill be lighter presently the man answered shortly at any rate laughed the boy as he disentangled his metal foot from a dense growth of brambles the others have not been here i doubt if any man or boy has ever come so far before there is no sign of a pathway is there we shall come across a pathway very soon said sary Alton i don't see any hazels hereabout remarked melor peering through the thick autumnal foliage how the leaves have fallen in some places and in others how they cling to the trees just as we cling to life sary Alton. the boy was walking a little ahead of his companion holding a briar here and a branch there that it might not be in the way of the man whose ashy haggard face he did not look at give me your bag the jailer said suddenly no not the sack the book satchel really sary Alton, i don't think we can get much further said melor as he took from his shoulder the satchel which hung by a strong leathern strap we should need an axe to force our way through the undergrowth if it gets too thick i'll cut it away with my dagger the man muttered in a low tone he had already taken the weapon from its sheath and unperceived by the lad was cutting off the strap of the satchel oh but that long dagger was keener than a butcher's knife suddenly melor gave a little cry his arms had been seized from behind and already the leathern thong was binding the hand of silver to the hand of flesh sary alton was all the boy could exclaim as the man seized him roughly and began to bare his throat for one long moment the liquid eyes of the child rested upon the face of the man a face upon which murder was written large and then the lad shut his eyes and prayed sweet jesus pity and forgive me as i forgive sary Alton and my uncle he murmured and even as the words rose to heaven the dagger fell and the pool of blood was dyeing the yellow leaves with a lurid crimson a certain courage came back to the murderer now that his victim lay stiff and stark at his feet the afternoon had waned 
Twilight had fallen, and the woodland was very still. Sari Alton told himself that he had a duty to perform. He must lose no time in giving his master some positive proof of Melor's death. To carry the entire body to court was impossible. He would cut off the head and bear it with all speed through the gathering darkness of the autumnal day, straight to the feet of Reynold. As for the body, what better tomb could it have than this untrodden spot of forest land? Soon would the showers of falling leaves cover it with the pall of crimson and russet, and hide it for ever from the face of man. So away sped Serialton upon his horrible mission, trying in vain to get comfort from the thought that however great was the crime he had committed, he had at least done his duty to a tyrant master. Away he ran with his dreadful, if sacred, burden, scarce noticing that he was plunging deeper and deeper into the forest, until he found himself confronted with a darkness so pitchy and a growth of brambles so dense that he was fain to retrace his steps. Even when after a protracted journey through the forest he found himself on the highway, the road he had to traverse was long and difficult. And though he dreaded the thought of meeting any human being, the darkness and the solitude weighed upon him heavily. An almost unbearable thirst afflicted him, and yet even when at long intervals he found himself near a dwelling-house, he dared not venture to beg a cup of water. Through the darkness of a starless and moonless night, the soft, pleading eyes of Melor seemed to look into his own. Oh, to be rid of the terrible burden that he carried in the bag upon his shoulder! Oh, to find what he knew could not be found in the region he was traversing, a priest to shrive him from his awful sin! Gladly now that he came to consider the matter, most gladly would he have given his own life if by doing so he could have saved that of this innocent and affectionate boy. To Serialton, as he made his unsteady way through the darkness, it seems as though one of the tortures of hell was already afflicting him. His thirst was intolerable. Almost maddened by his intense longing for drink, he cried out, "'Wretch that I am! I shall die by the roadside for want of a drop of water!' To his intense astonishment, a voice seemed to answer him out of the darkness. Nay, to be speaking almost in his very ear. Sari Alton, strike the ground near you, and you will find a spring. In an agony of fear he dropped the bag with its sad burden to the earth. Whatever the fact may have been, to him the voice was the clear, sweet treble of Melor, whose living tones had so often and so lately fallen upon his ear. Yet, startled as he was so terrible was the agony of his thirst that he began to grope about in the darkness and to strike the ground with his staff and behold on his right hand ran a stream of pure water of which he made haste to drink it was nearly midnight when serialton reached the prince's palace and demanded immediate audience with his master reynold had retired to rest but was lying awake plotting and planning how best to make secure the throne to which he had no right. No sooner did he hear of Serialton's arrival than he ordered him to be admitted. Sire, began the murderer, placing his bag upon the floor, the deed is done. Behold the head of Melor. Eagerly did the usurper stretch out his hands to take the yet bloody relic of his brother's son. Fixedly did he look upon the beautiful face of the boy who, however violent his end, had died in the grace of God and at peace with all men. "'It is enough,' exclaimed the prince at length. "'Take it out of my sight. Give to it and to its trunk the burial of a prince. I am not well. Send my servants to me.' Even as he had gazed at the still features of the murdered child, he had sickened and fallen into a mortal complaint. Three days afterwards, Reynold appeared before the judge of the living and the dead. Serialton did not linger at court. On the very morning after his arrival, he set out early for the forest in which lay the body of Melor. 
carrying with him the severed head and determined in his bitter sorrow and penitence that he would not rest until the young prince had received the obsequies of a christian morning was somewhat advanced when he plunged into the woodland and began his sorrowful search for the headless corpse deeper and deeper he made his way until the shadow of thickly planted trees led him into the dark gloom of the thicket in which he had committed his terrible crime suddenly he stopped blinded and bewildered there could be no doubt that he was approaching the scene of the crime and yet just at the point where yesterday the shadows had been so dense that even the strong afternoon sunlight could not pierce them a brilliant white light bathed the little hollow in its beauty trembling with fear he pushed his way through thorns and brambles thinking at every step of the terrible death march he had led the unsuspecting boy not many hours before as he advanced the light increased white indeed was the lovely radiance and yet tinged and shot with gold pressing on in his eagerness to see if possible the source of this wonderful illumination his first thought was that the monks of the abbey had found the body and were preparing to sing its dirge in the forest or he asked himself were they making ready to bury the poor innocent in the very place where they had found him lying for the light seemed now to be that of many waxen torches tapers indeed there were lighted tapers beyond counting but who were the white-clad bearers of these innumerable candles surely they were not the dead boy's schoolfellows young indeed they seemed to be but how utterly unlike the rough shock-headed cornish lads of the monastery school boys they undoubtedly were but surely such radiant spiritual countenances as these were never worn by mortal children was it possible that heaven had sent its bodyguard of youthful angels to watch the headless trunk of reynolds victim a vision of blinding beauty in very truth it was too dazzling for the unhappy wretch who vainly endeavoured to reach the outer ring of these celestial watchers with a great cry for mercy Serialton flung himself face forward upon the earth and lay there confessing his sin and imploring the forgiveness of heaven whether he had swooned or only slept he knew not somebody was bending over him and the kind voice of father jerome was in his ear slowly raising himself to a kneeling posture he exclaimed for the love of god father hear the confession of a sinner whose guilt is greater than he can bear even while he made his confession he was conscious of the tramp of many feet in the immediate neighbourhood long before he had finished the chant of the miserere assured him that the monks and boys were already bearing the body of melor to the abbey sorrowfully yet soothingly the wail was borne back to him on the noonday air the deep voices of the monks alternating with the piercing treble of the lads and turning the dim woodland into a temple of prayer and supplication away in the distance the lights of many funeral torches glimmered through the trees and when the miserere ceased a brighter gladder chant rose jubilantly enough to heaven the canticle of praise and thanksgiving that is used at the obsequies of innocent little ones benedicite omnia opera domini domino laudate et superexaltate ium in saecula it need not surprise us that the voice of the people canonized the poor child whose life had been pure and holy and whose death had been so cruelly sad wonderful things were spoken of and believed by the simple cornish folk of those remote times and to this day it is told how all through the dark october night that followed upon his murder the dark wood was lit up with a heavenly light and the forms of angel children were seen kneeling around the headless body and hovering over the spot that was soaked with its life blood many years afterwards some if not all of mellor's relics were carried to the little town of amesbury in wiltshire where a benedictine nunnery was founded by elfrida the widow of edgar who thus tried to make some expiation for the assassination of her own son at corfe castle 
the pre-reformation church in this old world town still retains its ancient dedication to our lady and saint melor or melorius as it is sometimes written the unhappy serialton gave himself up entirely to penance leading the austere life of a hermit and never ceasing to implore the mercy of god and the intercession of the holy boy whose life he had so ruthlessly taken End of section one Section two of Melor of the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Melor of the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages by David Byrne. The Brother of the Apples the wistful looks of the children as they passed the fruit-filled orchard troubled him the longing looks of them the half-averted gaze of the sorely tempted the shamefacedness of the scrupulous among them who feared they had already broken the tenth commandment all this disturbed the soul of the old gardener brother in truth a good man this brother godfrey and an arboriculturist of repute great in grafting and pruning wonderful in his knowledge of the ways of the tree doubtless the orchards of glastonbury bore marvellous fruit certainly the laden boughs of malmesbury made pictures as well as pies for the pilgrim the apples of croyland had name and fame throughout the land the pears cultivated by the good cistercians of warden and the huge warden pies made by these non meat-eating monks were in renown but for an orchard that was verily a forest of fruit and a natural cloister of incomparable coolness i sing the praises of that of which brother godfrey was the guardian it was not an apple garth of yesterday planted when were built the great cloisters that on one side at least were its boundary it contained many a tree past bearing many a bough that the coming winds of winter would bring to earth many a gnarled and twisted trunk upon which only the mistletoe flourished many a moss-grown hollow bowl that the woodman would fain have removed but what booted it asked brother godfrey that a few useless trees should stand here and there among the laden boughs that filled the croft from end to end had they not once yielded fruit to the eater yea and to the thirsting traveller the cool and sparkling cider no mere hive of drones was this big benedictine abbey in the sweet west country once a wilderness of weeds and a tangle of thorns overrun by the wolf and the wild boar coming to it when he himself was a young boy brother godfrey had found it much as it was to-day a little more perfect in detail now perhaps somewhat larger in area and its walls filled with an ever-growing community he had begun his life as a garden boy and coming into the autumn time in this month of rich september the first task appointed him had been the stripping of some of these very boughs fifty years ago yet how well he remembered it nay the recollection made him smile and when the good lay brother smiled he looked the man he was a happy and a holy monk yet holy man as he was he smiled at the recollection of a fault at nothing less than his first breach of the rule for unthinkingly as he plucked the rosy fruit from the boughs he had lifted an apple to his mouth had tasted it and found it was honey sweet and good had eaten it with relish and a clear conscience the brothers with him must have seen the deed but honest men they had made no sign either of knowledge or of disapproval not many days after it fell out that the novice master reached his instruction on that portion of the rule which forbids promiscuous eating then to the seeming enormity of his fault were the eyes of the boy novice suddenly opened he trembled as he sat upon his bench of stone listening to the grave voice of the novice master 
would it cost him the habit to which he so longingly aspired would he be shut up in the abbey prison for a space like the truant scholar he had seen conducted thither that very morning with the gyves upon his feet or would he be publicly flogged and sent back to his sorrow-stricken parents fearfully and brokenly and as one expecting no mercy the boy sought his novice master and made known his fault surely in all his life he had not wept so long or so bitterly as on that doleful day and behold the young and stern father michael listened sympathetically and did not even scold him like the dear holy father he was he dried the penitent's tears and gave him the consolation of a saintly instructor comforted and consoled him even while he explained the rule which forbade the eating out of meal-times and he gave him a trifling penance for his fault yes such a little penance you will find my son that there will be apples on the refectory table to-day and through the bounty of god for many days and weeks to-day my child you may abstain from fruit not for that day only but for several days did brother godfrey punish himself but oh how good the apples tasted afterwards to-day he laughed at the recollection and yet the laughter quickly left his face and he sighed deeply the thought of the wistful looks of the village laddies as they passed the orchard gate and the remembrance of something that father ambrose had told him the day before made brother godfrey sad for the zealous father ambrose had the spiritual care of the big hamlet outside the abbey gates the thorpe that lay so close and almost plastered like a martin's nest to those old walls the village that like so many proud english cities would never have existed but for the coming of the monks it was father ambrose indeed who had to mingle in that little outside world and like the monk of arthur's time knowing every honest face of theirs as well as ever shepherd knew his sheep and every homely secret in their hearts delight himself with gossip and old wives and ills and aches and teethings lyings in and mirthful sayings children of the place that have no meaning half a league away or lulling random squabbles when they rise chafferings and chatterings of the market cross rejoice small man in this small world of his yes even in their hens and in their eggs and be it added in their apples for the summer had been less sunny than usual and as the village lay at the abbey entrance low down in the valley its little apple garths had not caught the heat that struck the monastery orchard on the slope of the hill and so this year many of their trees were all but fruitless the thought of this troubled brother godfrey nay it hurt him and haunted him it followed him to refectory and dormitory and church it pained him most when he heard the chorus of high eager voices commenting upon his own harvest of apples it came back whenever he heard the beat of wooden shoes on the stone floor of the cloister that night before the statue of our lady of pity he spoke about the matter long and lovingly to the holy child and his blessed mother the sub-prior was a good man with a dread of children and no taste for apples he was a man indeed with anything but a healthy appetite for food of any sort and his many infirmities were a much greater trial to himself than to those with whom he had to do an able and a holy man was father thomas but one who would never be elected to a higher post than that of sub-prior he was in truth rather a hard man and difficult to deal with nevertheless he was brother godfrey's immediate superior at the time and when the simple man spoke to him of the abundance of apples and the many children a good god had sent into the world to eat them father thomas rebuked him roundly bade him attend to the duties of his office and leave the children to those who had charge of them now because of the cider that was made in the abbey the cellarer always an important official had ever to be consulted in regard to the disposition of apples and it was he who arranged with brother godfrey 
and the cook as to the winter store of this useful fruit with the cellar then did the old lay brother put in his plea for the children hoping that this good father would try to obtain the consent of the prior but the cellar took alarm from the beginning with a big community like ours brother we can't have too many apples it's simply impossible there is hardly a barrel of cider left from last year and you're forgetting the number of new novices we've received since last christmas all young too most of them growing boys all apple eaters in truth we must feed our own first but i'll think about it yes said the cellarer jingling his keys i'll certainly think about it i will indeed brother then did brother godfrey turn him to the father prior it was an unfortunate moment the good prior was sorely troubled with a debt that was overdue a debt that could not have existed but for the failure of last year's wheat harvest you and your children he ejaculated but not ill-naturedly they want bread more than apples some of them and when the snow comes where will they get it save at the abbey here and where shall we get it if the winter is long and hard the prior went on his way deep in thought troubled a little by the duties of his office troubled much by the fear of debt but more than trustful to the providence that for so many centuries had blessed this domus day brother godfrey sighed he had done his best for the children he loved and he had failed they must go sadly and appleless but he brother godfrey must get him to the orchard and pick up the windfalls of the night yes he needed his biggest basket this morning all during the past long night the wind had roared and raved until at matin time it all but drowned the voices of the chanting monks but at prime it had suddenly subsided and now the sun shone warmly on the sweet september world drying the raindrops that lay upon the crimson and yellow apples like tears upon the cheeks of children his biggest basket yes but all his baskets would be needed to-day what a rain of ruddy and golden fruit the grass of the orchard seemed covered with the ripe and juicy apples speedily did brother godfrey fill his wicker hamper less speedily did he bear it to the abbey kitchen and there the brother saw a sight that gave him pause how could he have forgotten so great a vigil to-morrow was it not the feast of st michael of a truth he had not thought of it until he saw the young novices a little crowd of them sitting in the outer kitchens plucking the michaelmas geese beautiful birds they were hatched and reared on the abbey farm big and soft and plump and with feathers white as snow and there stood a knot of choir monks from the scriptorium keenly examining the quality of the quills carefully laying them aside and tying them in bundles the sight made brother godfrey very glad he would pray to st wolston that neither the thought nor the smell of roast goose might visit him within the minster walls for thought the simple old man i might never be able to take the resolution of that holy bishop and forswear the flesh of this bonny bird for ever but the brother was thinking more of other things than of roast goose the feast of st michael was one of the greatest of the year in this house of strict observance of days of fasting and abstinence as well as of feasts for it was ruled by abbot michael and was it not that holy man's feast day after some necessary conversation with the cook whose need of apples was this morning more pressing than ever brother godfrey went back to the orchard accompanied by two young novices with their baskets they walked in silence but the boys could not but see that the old man smiled as he walked a delightful thought had entered his mind and as he passed a certain apple tree he stopped and looked upon it with growing pleasure quickly the sturdy boy novices filled their baskets and returned to the kitchen then brother godfrey for all his sixty-two years got a big ladder and reared it against one particular tree it was the choicest in the orchard in the brother's mind and in his speech it was ever the abbot's tree 
it was old and gnarled and strangely twisted it bore little fruit but that little was the most honeyed in the entire goth year by year on this day it had been brother godfrey's privilege to bear a dish of apples to the abbot's cell year by year the gardener had picked the russet coated sweetlings for the michael mass banquet now the abbot michael was very old and because of his great age ninety-three years or more the rule of the community devolved largely upon the father prior seldom indeed was the holy man seen saving at the altar and in choir and though his children loved him well and he ever held himself accessible to them the infirmarian in whose charge he was did not encourage many visits to the abbot's cell but on his feast day after the solemn mass at nine o'clock it was known that he would expect to see his subjects or rather their representatives and to receive their congratulations happy were the monks of the scriptorium who had completed a great psalter written in black and red and wonderfully illuminated for presentation to their father on this particular day but equally happy was brother godfrey who had asked and obtained leave to carry a silver dish of apples to his old novice master and his lifelong friend old in years was abbot michael but young in heart youthful with the youthfulness of the saints joyous with the joyousness of the true ascetic he received brother godfrey with affectionate delight nay my son you shall not remain upon your knee he said pointing to a stool that stood by his chair sit here my child and let us talk a while of past days you are one of the last of my own novices are you not brother yes one of the last you make me feel very ancient for you yourself are beginning to look old yet i remember your coming so well a red-cheeked curly-headed little lad with such a shy smile and such an innocent look nay brother and the look did not belie you the venerable abbot took the lay brother's rough hand in his own thin palm and pressed it affectionately and you bring me apples the abbot went on you bring me the fruits of your own labor the same good apples too that you have brought me year after year it is wonderful this can scarcely happen again dear brother the days of my years are almost fulfilled i cannot expect to keep another michaelmas on earth my son i would have you ask a boon of me never yet have you permitted your father to bestow aught upon you but his blessing that indeed you shall have but i would entreat you to ask me some favour some it was at this point that brother godfrey surprised both the abbot and himself the simple man marvelled at the rush of words that suddenly flowed from his lips he did not know that a warm heart makes for eloquence and that a great opportunity loosens the strings of speech but he did wonder both then and afterwards at his own courageous fluency not forgetting to tell the abbot of his talk with the sub-prior with the cellarer and with the prior brother godfrey earnestly and all but tearfully preferred his request he asked a privilege for himself and for all future custodians of the orchard throwing himself again on his knees he begged that a certain measure of apples might be reserved for the children of the village for ever call the prior the sub-prior and the cellarer the abbot said with a smile and ask them to be provided with parchment and ink and pens and so it fell about that on this feast of saint michael the brother of the apples received a document granting him and his successors plenary power to bestow upon all and sundry of the children of the thorpe but especially upon the progeny of the very poor abundant and unstinted measure of ripe apples for ever end of section two Section 3 of Meller of the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Meller of the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages by David Byrne. 
Good King Wenceslas. One of the greatest misfortunes that can happen to any child is to have a depraved and unbelieving mother. Young Wenceslas, the son of the ruler of Bohemia, and his brother Boleslas, had for mother a cruel and impious pagan. Happily for the boys, their father was a true Christian, the son of the first Catholic Duke of Bohemia, whose wife is known in history as Blessed Ludmilla. After the death of her husband, this holy princess lived at Prague, and to her great joy her grandson, Wenceslas, was placed by his father in her wise and loving care. Her chaplain became the boy's tutor, and under the guidance of this singularly holy and prudent man, Wenceslas soon began to give signs of solid piety and lasting goodness. After some years he was sent to college at Budwis, a place more than sixty miles from Prague, and there he made progress both in learning and in virtue, being, it is said, notably careful in shunning the things that make for sin. When his father died, Wenceslas was still young, and his pagan mother determined to govern Bohemia in his stead. Immediately she began to make war upon the Catholic religion. She ordered every church to be closed, stopped the exercise of all Christian rites, and imitating the conduct of Julian the Apostate, whose impiety is at this time being emulated by the French government, forbade priests to give any instruction to the young. Not content with this, she repealed all the laws made by her husband and his father in favor of the Christians, and in all the towns of Bohemia replaced the Catholic magistrates by her own followers. Promising him all the help in her power, the grandmother of Wenceslas, Blessed Ludmilla, implored the boy to check these outrages by taking his lawful place as the ruler of Bohemia. Greatly to the delight of the people he obeyed, and his wretched mother was deposed. His generosity is shown by the fact that in order to avoid disputes, he divided the country between himself and his younger brother. Sad to say, this younger brother, Bulislaus, was perverted by his wicked mother, who was enraged at her deposition and determined to be revenged upon both Wenceslas and his grandmother. Meanwhile, Wenceslas chose for his advisers the most upright and prudent ministers in his dominions, and did all in his power to establish and preserve peace. Like so many other saintly princes, he gives the lie to those enemies of Jesus Christ, who try to maintain that a pious king cannot be a good ruler. Religion is for all men, whether their character be strong or weak, and it is difficult to say if the masterly and self-reliant, or the timid and incapable, have more need of divine help. In Wenceslas there was no suspicion of weakness. His piety was profound. He gave his days to business and his nights to prayer. His devotion to the adorable sacrament was so remarkable that with his own hands he sowed the corn for the altar bread, while he gathered the grapes and made the wine used in the holy sacrifice. He usually left his bed at midnight, going to the churches to pray even when snow lay on the ground, and if the church doors were shut, he was content to kneel in the porch. His daily life was filled with works of mercy, both corporal and spiritual. Wherever there was want or trouble or distress, there the king appeared. Orphans and widows, the sick, the dying, prisoners in their cells, all were visited and relieved by him. He ruled his kingdom by his virtues rather than by force, says the breviary, and it was the greatest possible grief to him when he was compelled to pass sentence of death upon the guilty. In the dead of night he would go to the prisons and console those who were shut up, giving them food and money, as well as advice and comforting words. It is said that walking barefoot through snow and ice, his bleeding footprints gave out heat. In some parts of England this legend, prettily versified by the late Dr. Neal, is well known as a Christmas carol. Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen, when the snow lay round about, deep and crisp and even. Brightly shone the moon that night, though the frost was cruel when a poor man came in sight gathering winter fuel the king asks his page who the poor man is and where he lives finding that his dwelling is a goodly kins underneath a mountain wenceslas exclaims bring me flesh and bring me wine bring me pine logs hither thou and i will see him dine when we bear them hither page and monarch forth they went forth they went together through the rude wind's wild lament and the bitter weather but in the darkness and the cold the boy's heart fails him whereupon the good king says mark my footsteps my good page 
tread thou in them boldly thou shalt find the winter's rage freeze thy blood less coldly following in his master's steps the boy finds that heat was in the very sod which the saint had printed the king's revengeful mother was determined that her son should have no peace the grandmother of wenceslaus found that her daughter-in-law was plotting to take her life in no way disturbed the holy old woman distributed her goods among her servants and the poor made her confession and prepared herself for death hired assassins found her prostrate in prayer before the altar of her chapel and strangled her with her own veil not satisfied with this abominable crime the king's mother invited radislas prince of garima to invade her son's territory anxious to maintain the peace of his country wenceslas sent a message to radislas asking what offence he had given him and suggesting terms of reconciliation radislas treated the message with contempt and answered that the entire surrender of bohemia was his only condition of peace physical courage is a great gift moral courage is a far greater one wenceslas had both he immediately marched against the enemy of his country when the two armies met the saint asked for speech with radislas who was soon to be convinced that if sometimes a bad man may be a hero of a sort a man of god is doubly and trebly a hero greatly to his surprise radislas found himself challenged to single combat why should we shed the blood of our followers wenceslas asked let the battle be between us the leaders radislas could not refuse to accept such a challenge a very different matter to be remembered to a duel still despising his pious antagonist the invader assured himself of an easy victory armed with only a short sword the brave wenceslas met his country's foe the fight was brief enough failing to fling his javelin to the astonishment of his men radislas threw down his weapons and fell upon his knees he had not struck a single blow without a struggle the invading king yielded to the saintly and courageous wenceslas the good king's troubles did not cease with his victory over radislas wenceslas had now to turn his attention to his own country some of his nobles were oppressors of the poor and this with other disorders the king checked with necessary severity his action did not make him popular with these unworthy men and when the unnatural mother of wenceslas began to plot against her son's life they readily came to her aid and that of the younger son the pagan Boleslas. a child had been born to Boleslas, and a pressing invitation was sent to wenceslas to be present at the celebration of so important an event suspecting nothing wenceslas accepted it was the twenty eighth of september in the year nine thirty eight the entertainment was on a magnificent scale but true to his usual habits when midnight came wenceslas went to the church urged by his mother Boleslas and some attendants followed him the holy king received many wounds from the men-at-arms but it was his own brother who in the end ran him through the body with a lance the enemies of god and religion triumphed as they often do for a time to avenge the murder of wenceslas the emperor otho i subjugated bohemia and forced boleslas to submit soon after the assassination of her son his mother lost her life one account seems to suggest that she perished in an earthquake terrified by his mother's fate and the many miracles worked at his brother's tomb boleslas caused the saint's body to be translated to the church of saint vitus at prague and the church built by wenceslas himself for the reception of the body of his saintly grandmother it is pleasant to record that the son and successor of boleslas became not only one of the greatest rulers of the period but the faithful follower in the footsteps of his uncle saint wenceslas note the following account of the preparation of the bread and wine for the altar at cluny is an instance of the care taken in this matter in the ages of faith there are numberless beautiful rites of benediction observed as that of the ripe grapes which were blessed on the altar during mass on the sixth of august and afterwards distributed in the refectory of new beans and of the freshly pressed juice of the grape the ceremonies observed in making the altar breads were also most worthy of note the grains of wheat were chosen one by one were carefully washed and put aside in a sack which was carried by one known to be pure in life and conversation at the mill then they were ground and sifted he who performed this duty being clothed in an alb and amice two priests and deacons clothed in like manner prepared the breads 
and a lay brother, having gloves on his hands, held the irons in which they were baked. The very wood of the fire was chosen of the best and driest, and whilst these processes were being gone through, the brethren engaged ceased not to sing psalms, or sometimes recited Our Lady's office. End of section 3《even in Paris, Paris of the fourteenth century, the influence of spring was making itself felt, yet brighter than the April sunlight, more joyous than the air of spring, was the gladsomeness that filled the hearts of many of the poor prisoners as they realized the near approach of Easter. To some, indeed, the glorious feast brought hope of liberty as well as of spiritual consolation. It was certain that the King of Alms, as he was called, would pay his customary visit, and that in honor of the great festival, two of their number would be unconditionally released, though some knew but too well that for them there was no hope of pardon, except from the good God. Yet in the ages of faith, even to the hopeless, Holy Church brought her consolations, and hard as was the condition of the hundred and thirty prisoners, there was not one who might not, if he would, be the happier for the coming of Easter. It was the morning of Holy Saturday, and in the chapel of the prison the church's offices were over. A number of Franciscan friars were already hearing the confessions of the prisoners. Walking slowly through the great vaulted wards where young and old alike were confined, several of the good fathers were engaged in comforting the sorrowful, and gently rebuking the obstinate, and in preparing the ignorant for their Easter reception of the sacraments. "'Ah, my father,' a poor man was saying to Pere Antoine, "'do plead with the king of alms for me. My case is such a sad one. I have a wife.' and my seven children are all young, and I know that they are starving, and I am not guilty of crime. It is only for not paying the king's taxes that I am here. The good friar smiled sadly as he said, My poor fellow, I pity you from my heart, but what can I do? So many of you, and only two to be released, and you know the king of alms nearly always chooses the youngest and the oldest. But not always, my father. God help you and bless you said the friar, turning away to hide his tears. Be sure I will do for you whatever is possible. Very slow was the good priest's passage through the ward. Men held and kissed his habit as he moved. Half a dozen would speak to him at once, all bent upon seeing his influence, all hoping against hope that they would be the favored ones of the coming king of alms. Now and again he would pause and make a signal for silence. Then he would speak to the crowd in a few tender words, begging them not to forget that on the morrow one greater than the king of alms surpassingly greater even than the king against whose peace they had offended was coming to them in a sacrament of love his heart ached as he passed on noticing that always on the fringe of the crowd were a number of young boys all eager to attract his attention all anxious to win his favour and his influence with the king of alms my children he called to them at length i will speak to you separately Go and await me at the upper end of the ward, for it is quieter. With a great shout of joy they rushed away in a body, some thirty or forty lads, most of them in their very early teens, few of them without a fetter or shackle of some sort. If the men had spoken eloquently, the boys were not less disposed to plead their own cause, and when Father Antoine approached them, their vociferousness almost stunned him. His raised hand silenced them. Very gently and touchingly he spoke telling them how grieved he was that he could not release them all. It is so perfectly natural, my poor children, he went on, that you should long to be free, and for this I do not blame you in the least. Yet, my dear ones, for some of you it is almost better that you should remain here for a time. Some of you have no homes, and if I could obtain your release, you would not be willing to go to an orphanage or to a hospital. One half of them were in rags, and showed every possible sign of poverty and neglect. Of the rest, some were young apprentice lads, well-clad and healthy-looking, imprisoned for unruliness and various forms of misconduct. A few were sons of citizens, undergoing punishment for different breaches of the law, 
small thefts wilful damage stone throwing and riotous conduct in the streets at carnival time one or two appeared to be of better quality still and judging by their dress might have been the sons of gentlemen of rank or pages in the service of some rich noble not one of them could have reached the age of fifteen several of them were under twelve as the father looked over the big group of young faces some sleek and rosy some pale and sunken nearly all eager and anxious his eye fell upon a well-grown but young-looking lad in the background who seemed to be taking little or no interest in what was going on while the rest pushed and jostled one another and tried to get to the front this boy remained quite still his eyes cast down and his hands folded in front of him he was clad in a rich suit of dark red velvet laced with gold and his long black hair framed a face that was distinguished as much for its regular features as for the pallor of its complexion a sudden lurch on the part of the crowd left this boy standing alone and the father then saw that not only was the richly clad lad wearing fetters on both legs but that he alone of all the youngsters had manacles on his wrists but time was pressing and the friar could not linger my children how many of you have been to confession he inquired as he turned to leave the ward there was a quick response from every member of the crowd except one all had been to confession or were then going saving the boy with irons on his hands at any rate he made no sign passing out of the great vaulted room into the corridor that led to the chapel the priest met the head jailer the dark-haired boy in red began the friar as the man knelt for his blessing the one who looks like a page and who is more strongly fettered than the others what has he done the jailer smiled as he said well holy father i don't think he's done much more than any other lad would have done in the same circumstances he is one of the pages of the count de la ville who was in attendance upon his son the young count who if i may whisper it is the spoiled pet of a silly mother the young lord threw a silver dish at this boy who immediately threw it back again the petted lad was not hurt but the lady mother screamed and had this unfortunate page arrested unhappily for him the count is away at the wars the lad had no one to speak for him and the judge who is related to my lady sentenced him to a year's imprisonment has he been violent since he was brought here not at all father until yesterday under great provocation no doubt he knocked the lad down and was brought to me for a whipping for which however i substituted a day in hand irons it is unfortunate for him poor lad since monseigneur the governor was going to recommend him to the king of alms as one of the two to be released on monday and you think he has forfeited his chance my father i am not sure of that it is very probable does the boy know that he was one of the two favoured ones no no my father that is our secret beside the governor only your reverence and i know of it your secret is safe with me said the friar what troubles me is that he has not been and does not seem likely to go to the sacraments ah poor child he is dejected perhaps you have not spoken with him privately father but how could you in the midst of such a crowd can your reverence spare five minutes i ought now to be in the confessional but certainly i will speak to him if you can bring him here side by side up and down the long cloister-like corridor walked the friar and the boy whose handcuffs had been taken off though his leg irons made sad music as he moved but my child the priest was saying it is better to be freed from the prison of the soul than from that which confines the body my father for me it is of no use it seems only to make me worse said the boy when i made my first communion last noel i thought now i shall be really good yet before the epiphany i was in prison this week i had been thinking about my confession yet only yesterday and good friday too i got into a big rage and struck a boy you see father for me at least it is no good what are the sacraments for my son to bring one the grace of god and what is it that at this moment your soul needs most the boy was silent your greatest need my child is the very help that you seem afraid to seek perhaps you have heard some holy person once said that one communion is enough to make a saint you made your communion and afterwards you discovered that you were not a saint how old are you on the feast of st peter and st paul i shall be thirteen ah well my poor child older people than you have made similar mistakes but now i want you to see what a big mistake it is it is like refusing food because you are hungry or taking off your doublet because you are cold 
nay if you think of it it is much more foolish than either of these things would be it is turning your back upon your best friend it is running away from the tender and merciful god who loves you for whom do you think our blessed lord instituted confession and communion for saints or for sinners the lad looked up but hesitated in his reply to whom did he first give holy communion asked the friar the apostles my father yes and at that time were they saints do you think and what did they do on the very day after their first communion the first good friday they ran away from him and is that what the saints do oh no my father is it what you are going to do my child a little sob was the only reply remember my son that our one hope of salvation lies through a good use of the sacraments if we refuse them we are lost whatever the mercy of god may do for those who cannot approach them or for those who have never heard of them he will do nothing for us if we neglect the means of grace that he himself has provided for us whatever may happen to you however frequently you may fall nay even if which god forbid you fell into grievous sin on the very day of communion go back to confession go again to communion this is how weak men overcome the snares of the wicked one this is how sinners become saints sometimes it is only after many humble confessions and devout communions that the hasty and passionate become patient and gentle in order to overcome yourself my child you have only to persevere in spite of failure for the remainder of that holy saturday and during the glorious day that followed it the prison scarcely seemed to be a place of punishment mindful of that much-needed corporal work of mercy many of the faithful had visited the imprisoned bestowing abundant alms and money and in food and in clothes every prisoner not a notorious criminal was relieved of his irons fresh straw for bedding was supplied to all spring flowers made their way into the gloomy vaults lutes were tuned and a small band of imprisoned minstrels were permitted to go from ward to ward singing paschal canticles the bells of the parish churches pealed out gloriously adding their festive message to the general jubilation father antoine wept for joy as he assisted at the general communion only one or two poor obstinate wretches had refused the sacraments but it is certain that pierre de gosquin the whilom page of count de laville was not among them passing down the great vault in which pierre and the rest were confined the friar found him playing an after-dinner game with two or three prentice lads the moment he caught sight of father antoine he ran to his side and reverently kissed his beads why smiled the priest you are an entirely different child i scarcely recognize you my son you look quite gay my father i am very happy said the boy gently never again will i run away from the good god then my child you need fear nothing strengthen that resolution as much as ever you can but the lad's look of gladness was so marked that the friar began to wonder if the governor had already told the young prisoner of his possible release are you thinking of to-morrow pierre and of the king of alms the lad laughed gaily as he answered oh no my father for me there is not the least chance if a boy is set free it is generally the youngest unless he is very bad and there are seven eight yes i think nine who are younger than i am yes yes said the priest but i do hope that poor man over there the one who is sitting near that pillar father will be one of the two his wife came to see him yesterday and she wept so bitterly one of their children died last week and another is very sick and is crying out for his father it does seem so sad and the man is only here for a debt poor fellow exclaimed the priest but you are right my pierre to wish for his release only alas there are several similar cases there is a man in bed whose only hope of recovery lies in his release i wish oh how i wish began the lad and hesitated what do you wish my child well father i do so wish i could persuade the boy who will be released to give his chance to one of these men but of course that is too much to expect isn't it the friar looked at the boy keenly and without speaking well for me it wouldn't matter because you see my mother is dead and my father is at the wars with the count but i know that some of these boys have fathers and mothers who will be so unhappy until their sons are released and would you really give your own liberty for one of these two men my son the boy laughed merrily as he said but my father of course i would unfortunately i shall not have the chance 
you would not wish me to say this to the governor i think but if there were the least chance for me my father i would implore you to do so said the boy monday morning came and again the bells of the churches pealed out a band of trumpets in the courtyard of the prison told of the arrival of le roi de l'almon and the excitement among the prisoners grew painfully intense expecting nothing for himself pierre the page stood on the fringe of the crowd of prisoners waiting for the trumpets to cease waiting tremblingly for the proclamation of the herald of the king of alms a great shout arose as the first name was announced a shout of approbation for jacques alban the man whose dying child was calling for him had the sympathy of many vociferously enough did pierre shout with the rest but when the applause had subsided and the herald in his stentorian voice called out the name of pierre de gascon the bearer of that name staggered and fell on the stone floor in a deep swoon when pierre recovered consciousness he found himself lying on a silken couch in a tapestry hung chamber the governor's wife was holding his hand and the governor was bathing his temples so exclaimed the latter as the boy opened his eyes ah that is good we shall soon be well again eh take this my brave one pierre sipped the cordial glancing at the man's face as he did so the governor was certainly smiling but neither his words nor his smile seemed to be ironical and his manner was fatherly and kind poor little one cried the lady as she bent over him and pushed the long hair back from his forehead and eyes poor little brave one oh but your colour is coming back quickly you will soon be quite well yes you want to ask questions do you your eyes are interrogatory well well my child everything is quite as you would wish it the good pere antoine told us of your generous desire the poor sick prisoner is free i shall call you my brave one once again ah can you sit up that is good now another sip of this fine cordial but there is no cordial in the world like timely bestowed praise and pierre was already beginning to feel strong and glad yes the two men are released said the governor an hour later when pierre declared that now he felt quite well and able to walk my lady had apparently left the room and you my poor child remain a prisoner the man went on ah that is sad but monsieur it would have been sadder for him you think so well well that is as it may be and you feel now that you are quite ready to go back to prison quite ready my lord said pierre jumping up from his seat the governor suddenly turned away his head his eyes had fallen on the boy's hose much worn about the ankles and showing unmistakably where the friction of fetter rings had frayed them how long have you to remain in confinement asked the man still looking away from pierre not quite nine months my lord nine months ejaculated the governor under his breath he muttered mon dieu to a youngster nine months is a lifetime then something happened so suddenly and so quickly that for a moment it took away pierre's breath for almost before he realized that madame had entered the governor's wife rushed across the salon threw her arms about the astounded boy and folded him to her breast my poor little brave one she cried this naughty governor is teasing you the good pere antoine has just arrived with your pardon from the king himself you are my prisoner now i have put you deep down in the dungeons of my heart are you content to remain there my brave child but madame pierre's speech was broken by a sob nay nay said the governor taking the boy's hand call her mother the good god has at length sent us a son ha ha here is pere antoine come in my father and give us your blessing not only did pierre de gascon become the adopted son of the governor and his wife but in after years he succeeded to his foster father's important and honourable office known to his generation as the pitiful governor he was ennobled by the king and led a long life of usefulness and piety a life filled with works of mercy and charity but always his watchword was never run away from the good god no matter how great a criminal he had to deal with or how utterly hopeless might seem to be the case of some poor prisoner committed to his care governor de gascon gave himself no rest until he had persuaded young and old alike to seek again and again the sacrament of reconciliation and the sacrament of love note in some cities two prisoners were always released at christmas easter and pentecost end of section four section number five of miller of the silver hand 
and other stories of the bright ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Meller of the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages by David Byrne Gisli the Icelander Gisli was fifteen years old, and tomorrow he had to die. He was sturdy and strong and full of life and health as any Norse boy in the land. Nevertheless, by this time tomorrow he would be a corpse and his death would be a violent and ingormenious one. That was the hardest part of the terribly hard fact. Young as he was, he would have a strong halter knotted about his sunburnt neck, and in the sight of his own countrymen he would swing from the gallows of King Magnus. The condemned lad had no more tears to weep. In the darkness and the silence of his cell he could do nothing but pray. It was true that he had committed a great crime, and for that he was truly sorry, yet it seemed to him that at least some soul on earth might pity him and allow that the sin, great as it was, had not been committed without great provocation. But then not every son knew what it was to witness the murder of his own father, and the thought would come in spite of his prayers not every boy would have the courage enough to avenge his father's death. Yes, it was a wicked crime that Gisli had committed, and he had confessed it with true sorrow. His father was dead, his father's murderer was dead, and now he, Gisli, the killer of his father's murderer, had to die on the gibbet. More than once in his young and happy life he had been face to face with death. On the high seas, in storm and tempest, he had waited fearlessly for an end that seemed certain and immediate. But the sons of hardy Norsemen were born to brave the perils of the deep. Many seemed born to perish in the waters that, until the day of judgment, will never give up their dead. An honorable and happy ending that, though to the Norse boy, life is always fair and sweet. Until today, Gisli had not fully realized how desirable life could be, and how dear its possessor. Until the geeves had been fast riveted upon his sturdy ankles, and the manacles of steel securely locked upon his brown wrists, he had not experienced this complete sense of hopelessness, this knowledge of utter uselessness of any attempt to escape his fate, the absolute blankness of soul and feeling that now oppressed him. Heavy as was the weight of iron upon his limbs, he scarcely felt it. Soul and body alike seemed numbed, and only the absolute numbness of death could be greater. Ah, why had not he and his poor murdered father remained in their Iceland home? Why had they settled in this land of Norway, and under a king so tyrannical as Magnus? Yet they had only done what so many countrymen of theirs in the twelfth century were wont to do. Alas for the day when they met the murderous servant of the king. Here within the precincts of the royal residence were many of Gish countrymen, too powerless, however, and too few to help the unfortunate lad for whom the gallows were already prepared. Doubtless his one friend, Teet, the son of Islaf had done what he could, but what power on earth could change the will of Magnus? It was the king's servant the boy had slain. It was the king himself who had condemned Gisli to the gibbet. It seemed to the weary boy that he had slept long and heavily, and that he had been awakened by the sound of his shackles striking the stone floor as he turned him in his sleep. But no, there was a noise of voices outside his cell. Perhaps it was already morning, and the officers had come to lead him to the gallows. It must be, he thought, that through sheer heaviness and grief he had spent the half of yesterday and the whole of the night in sleep. Now, 
At any rate, he was fully awake. The voices were nearer and were raised in anger. There was an iron striking upon iron, and the blows were falling upon the bolted door of his cell. Was it possible that his friends, his own countrymen, had banded themselves together and were coming to rescue him? Surely that was the voice of Tiet, the son of Islif. Suddenly, and with great crash, the cell door was flung open, and Tiet and his Icelandic followers rushed in triumphantly. "'Courage, Gisli!' shouted the young man. "'You shall not die on the gibbet. "'Now, lads, where are your hammers? "'Off with his irons! Quick!' Seizing a hammer, Tiet himself smashed the iron rings that encircled the boy's ankles, while another broke the handcuffs that confined his wrists. Gisli was free, and with a great shout the party fled from the prison. Almost immediately they found themselves surrounded by the king's guard. We will shed the very last drop of our blood in defense of this child of our country, shouted Tiet, drawing his sword and bidding his followers to do the same. Dazed and bewildered as he was, the newly released boy saw at once that the combat would be an unequal one. Brave and intrepid as his countrymen were, they were comparatively few in number, whereas the king's guard was strong and well armed, and its numbers could so easily be augmented. Yet it was a wonderful moment for Gisli. Hope had come back to him with a rush. Already he was freed from his cell, and from the irons that had confined his limbs. No longer was he alone, one poor solitary boy prisoner, condemned to a hateful death. But weapons were flourishing in the air, and men were advancing one upon another. Of a truth, the struggle would be brief and a bloody one. Brave as Tiet was, he would soon be overpowered by numbers. Courageous as were his followers, it was certain that they would soon be cut to pieces. Standing there and fully realizing the sweetness of life and freedom, Gisli came to the sudden and truly heroic resolution that his escape would only be bought at a terrible price. He could not, he would not suffer the shedding of his countrymen's blood. After all, he thought, the life of a boy was a small matter, enough compared with the lives of these brave Icelanders. Not one of you shall die for me, he shouted in his high boyish treble. Nay, my friends, I thank you from the bottom of my heart, and I love you for your goodness, but not one drop of blood shall be spilled for my sake. Resting himself from the kind arms that would have restrained him, the lad sprang forward and approached the king's men. I surrender, said the boy simply. Take me back to prison. Better that I should be hanged upon the gallows than these should die by sword. Strong hands were instantly laid upon him, and through the ranks of his weeping friends he was hurried back to a stronger and safer prison. On a great plain where the Council of the Thing, as it was called, was wont be held, stood the gallows upon which criminals were hanged. Great was the crowd assembled to witness the hanging of the boy Gisli, for not only had the king commanded the presence of his entire household together with many soldiers, but he had bidden every Icelander in the neighborhood to attend the execution. The morning was sunny and clear, but cold, and the poor boy was led out of his prison to look upon the beautiful earth for the last time. He shivered. Slowly, with his hands bound behind his back with thongs, Gisli walked in the midst of a strong guard to the place of doom. Once he raised his sea-blue eyes and saw the great crowd of onlookers, the king sitting in a high and prominent place, surrounded by soldiers. Again he lifted his head, and straight in front of him was that awful gibbet, the long-nosed rope swaying to and fro in the fresh morning breeze. 
Few indeed there were in that big crowd that did not pity and compassionate the young criminal. In the breasts of his own countrymen, deep sorrow struggled with rage and indignation. The lad was to be done to death before their very eyes, and they were powerless to deliver him. But among the many whose hearts were wrung with pity, there stood an Icelander, whose name was one day to be widely known, and whose fame was to extend far beyond the northern island, of which he was destined to be bishop. The saintly John of Hor had arrived only the night before, just in time to hear the sad story of Gisli and the account of his attempted rescue. Already with his friend the king, this holy priest, had pleaded long and earnestly for the life of the condemned lad. Made more angry and obdurate by the action of Tiet, Magnus would not listen. Gisli, he said, must die on the gibbet. In vain did the priest urge the criminal's tender years, the terrible provocation he had received on account of the murder of his own father, the heroism he had shown when he had been given an excellent chance of escaping the justice of the law. That brat shall be gibbeted, was all the king would say. Overwhelmed with sorrow, the man was one day to be known as St. John of Holar, and joined the crowd at the place of execution. Whatever spiritual comfort he could give to the poor child, that, of course, he was only too anxious to offer. Making his way to the culprit's side, John noticed that the boy was but lightly clad in a leather tunic, and that saving for the irons that had left upon them, his legs and feet were bare. You shall have this cloak, my poor child, said the compassionate priest, as he removed his own mantle and hood. Then, as he was about to wrap them around the trembling lad, John of Holar suddenly remembered that this garment had been given to him by no less a person than King Magnus himself. Turning away from Gisli for the moment, John approached the king, who was seated close to the gallows. Sir, began the priest, this cloak was your majesty's gift to me last winter. Have I your permission to do what I will with it the king gave an angry gesture of assent and immediately turning to the boy father john began tenderly to wrap the garment about him speaking in his ear words of comfort and consolation and encouragement be brave in death dear child as you have been brave in life the pain will be sharp but very short think now only of jesus crucified though you have sinned be true penitence, my son, you have been forgiven. Remember him who, through very innocence, was hung upon the gibbet of the cross. Lovingly, as a mother wraps her child before placing it in its cot to sleep, did the holy man fold the long cloak about the boy's body, hiding the bound hands and fettered feet, and carefully disposing the hood about the neck and shoulders. Impatiently enough stood the hangman, waiting to fix the noose of the rope upon the criminal's neck. A priest embraced him and gave him the image of the crucifix to kiss. Courage, my child, said John, as the boy began with difficulty to mount the ladder of death. Call upon Jesus with great confidence and love. Whispered words of absolution were the last sounds that fell upon Gish's ear as the rope was hurriedly affixed. A moment afterwards the body of Gisli was swinging in mid-air. No need now to linger in the neighborhood of the gallows. Far and near could the poor boy be seen, looking so small as it hung on high, swayed in gentle motion by the winds of heaven. Yet as the king returned hastily to his castle, it was noticed that his countenance was black as midnight, while the faces of the Icelanders were almost joyful. They knew, and the king knew, the significance that attached to the hanging of Gisli in the royal cloak. For the minds of those rough Norsemen, the boy's execution had been robbed of all its ignominy by the fact 
that he had suffered death in a robe that had once been property and probably worn by magnus himself in spite of the king's implacable anger the lad's end could be spoken of for all time as an honorable one so sad at heart as they were the icelanders slowly turned their back upon the gibbet and returned to their quarters greatly relieved in mind and invoking the blessing of heaven upon the kindly head of father john of holar father john himself had not yet done with the gallows or with the body hung thereon waiting until all was quiet and the great plain was cleared of spectators the priest returned to the gibbet praying to god with great fever he reared the ladder which had been flung upon the ground and mounted it hastily his task was a difficult one and he did not cease to implore the help of heaven had he succeeded or had he failed had the hangman unwittingly assisted him by a too hasty adjustment of the rope or unwittingly out of compassion for the boy himself the rope was cut gently did the priest bear the body to the earth with trembling eager fingers he undid the noose dio gratias sang the good man as he unwrapped the mantle and severed the thongs that bound the lad's hands to some purpose he had carefully disposed that hood about the child's throat it seemed certain that the neck was still unbroken yet gisli lay stretched upon the green grass insensible and apparently lifeless o oh god cried the priest give back to us the soul of this poor child and i promise that he shall not depart from thy house for ever a moment later great joy filled the soul of father john the eyes of gisli suddenly opened and he took a long deep breath then he looked at the holy man and said with a smile why did you wake me father because my dearest son it is time for us to go down to the sea said the priest breaking the iron rings upon the lad's feet even now our countrymen are abroad i am going to give you back to god and to your fatherland end of section five recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section number six of mailer of the silver hand and other stories of the bright ages this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c mailer of the silver hand and other stories of the bright ages by david byrne the smiling saint one saint makes many almost without number were the souls that saint columban the great irish missionary of the seventh century led to god numerous also were the disciples who followed him and were helped by him to reach a state of perfection among the latter few are more interesting and engaging than decalus very young must the boy have been when he left ireland to settle with columbian in east anglia and when the great founder of religious houses passed from england into france and began to build the famous abbey of luxiel delius could not have been very old certainly the lads of that period were not wanting in grit hard living hard labor the perils and dangers of travel immense application to study the performance of humblest offices these things were the daily bread of the young who gave themselves to the service of christ the source of courage such a willing happy service too decalus himself seems to have been the very soul of cheerfulness one of the many beautiful qualities that endeared him to his abbot he might well have earned for himself the nickname of the smiler for no matter what work he happened to be engaged in his face was always bright and sunny saint ignatius once asked a young brother why he was always laughing bidding him in the same breath to persevere 
in that holy cheerfulness which makes for perseverance in all good works. The same question was put to the young Decalus by St. Columban, and as the incident had been prettily versified by an anonymous poet, we cannot do better than quote the lines in full. Drawing the water, hewing the wood, Decalus the happy, Decalus the good, never without a smile on his face, full of a sweet particular grace, serving at table, singing in choir, fetching the logs to the great hall fire, teaching the boys their sacred song, smiling, smiling the whole day long. His saintly father, with calm gray eyes, looked on the youth with glad surprise. Odiculus happy, Odiculus good, tending the sick or watching the gate, laboring early and resting late, teaching grammar or teaching song. Why art thou smiling the whole day long? Decalus blushed, and I smile, said he, because no one can take my God from me. A great sorrow came to both Columban and Decalus when the fierce Queen Bruchant and her unworthy son, the King of Burgundy, expelled the abbot from the monastery of Luxio. But, like the man of courage that he was, Columban immediately set off to preach the gospel and to found more monasteries elsewhere. Among his followers was Decalus. Bravely they marched away, setting their faces toward another country, and leaving behind them an abbey that soon became one of the glories of France. Now from what follows it is clear that although Decalus was so merry and so active he was not very robust, or it may be that even at this period he was still nothing more than a growing boy. For after they had gone some distance on their weary journey, the lad's bodily strength was exhausted, and he was compelled to own that he was unable to walk any further. To part from his beloved abbot was indeed a hard thing, but it was inevitable. Greatly compassioning his disciple, St. Columban gave him the permission he sought to lead the life of a solitary. They were still in the kingdom of Burgundy, and no doubt St. Columban knew that the comparative fertility of the neighborhood would furnish the young hermit with the necessaries of life. Nevertheless, the parting was a very painful one. To say farewell was a bitter sorrow to both abbot and monk. Shedding many tears, Columban said, God Almighty, out of love to whom thou didst leave thy native land, and hast ever been to me a most obedient child, bring us together in the majesty of his glory. Then Decalus threw himself into the abbot's arms, weeping loudly and long. The Lord gave thee blessing out of Sion, said the saint, gently disengaging himself from the sobbing lad, and may he make thee to see Jerusalem in prosperity all thy life long. For the first time in his life, Decalus found himself in actual solitude. Throwing himself on his knees, he prayed fervently to his Father in heaven. Then he began to penetrate into the depths of the forest. He would build for himself a little hut far away from the homes of men, and there he would live on the fruits of the earth. For years he had been accustomed to hard fare and in the forest he would sometimes find berries and nuts. Commending himself to God as he went along, he came across a swineherd whose pigs were feeding upon the acorns. The man was astonished to see a stranger in such an out-of-the-way place. Decalus told him that he was a monk, and that he wanted to build a hermitage in some solitary spot where there was a stream of water. The swineherd said there was only one such place, and that was close to a little lake called Luthra. Could you not show me this place? said Decalus. I daren't leave my pigs to take care of themselves, the man answered. Don't be afraid of that, Decalus urged, planting his own staff in the ground. If you will go with me, this stick of mine shall keep them together until you return. We need never be astonished at the number of miracles that were worked in those primitive times. 
the simple fervent faith of people made them possible as well as the sanctity of many great servants of god who performed them fully believing the word of the young monk the swineherd brought him to luthra returning to find his pigs quietly feeding in the neighborhood of the youth's staff to the great joy of Deicolus, he found not only a lake with springs of sweet water but a little chapel dedicated to a saint who was greatly loved at that period saint martin of tours the young hermit's cheerfulness had indeed been much tried by the parting of his beloved father columban but god had been good to him in leading him to so pleasant a retreat and to the neighborhood of the forest chapel and his heart was full of thankfulness but Deicolus soon had reason to remember that the chapel was private property it belonged to a gentleman named wifehart and served by a priest who was anything but an amiable man one day when the monk went to make his usual prayer he found that the door and the windows had been filled with thorns and brambles disregarding these impediments Deicolus entered the chapel when the priest heard of it he told wifehart who flew into a rage and ordered his servants to find the hermit and give him a severe flogging unfortunately for their master the men obeyed him literally and almost immediately afterwards he was seized with a complaint that threatening to be fatal his good wife berthilda not doubting but the disease had been sent as a punishment for her husband's cruel conduct to the hermit sent her servants to implore Deicolus to visit the castle with all haste the holy man obeyed the summons and praying fervently to god did not leave wifehart until he was cured great good came out of the evil this man had done for as a thank offering to god and Deicolus, he bestowed upon the hermit not only the little estate of luthra but the chapel itself and the adjoining wood full of gratitude to god Deicolus sang this is my rest for ever and ever here will i dwell for i have chosen it soon after this it chanced that the king quothair the second came to the forest to hunt quietly reading in his cell Deicolus was startled by the sudden appearance of a wild boar hard pressed by the dogs Rushing into the hermit's little oratory, the beast fell, panting before the altar, while the monk, standing at his door, confronted the hunters and the dogs. The boar had taken sanctuary, said Deicolus, and his life must be spared. Marveling at the hermit's courage, the king asked him many questions and soon found that he was dealing with one of God's saints and a disciple of Columban. It is the duty and the privilege of the rich to offer gifts, and before the king rode away he had bestowed upon Deicolus the game in the forest, the fish in the streams, and the grapes in the neighboring vineyards. Then the hermit called to mind that Columban had once told him that, before his death, he should rule over three kingdoms. Here was the prophecy's fulfillment. So now Deicolus had means to build and support a community. Novices flocked to him in numbers, and his house soon became an important abbey. Journeying to Rome, he returned with a special charter from the reigning pontiff and many privileges. With great gentleness and sweetness, and an abiding cheerfulness which endured him to his subjects, he ruled his community for many happy years. End of section 6. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.